In essence, I'm going to share with you just some thoughts taken from Mark chapter 1. No, it's not Mark. Mark. Uh, I'll come a little mo in a moment to uh, my thanks to you. But Mark chapter 1 and verses 9 through to 15. <clears throat> I had prepared a title for this uh, particular sermon. Put yourself in the shoes of Jesus. Mark, you closed off our Sabbath school with uh, what does the Lord require of you but to walk humbly before your God. And it is in the context of that verse that I make this statement, put yourselves in the shoes of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised of John in Jordan. And straightway, Coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved son. You are the one in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that, John was put in prison, and Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark in his opening verse of this book, the second in the New Testament, touted by many to be the earliest written for the new Christian movement, though possibly some 30 years after Jesus himself had ascended, and Mark makes the comment that this is about the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's interesting when you sit down to write a letter or type it as some would do nowadays, that quite often the things that you open up with sound not contradictory to what you will write later on, but probably take on a different meaning. I guess the original Greek just simply says beginning the gospel of Jesus. And that's what Mark was on about at this point as he's writing. He wants to talk about what was happening at the beginning. He was wanting to make the point that at the beginning the gospel was already understood because his readers were listening, reading some 30 odd years after that. He was trying to probably re-establish the faith of those who were reading what he wrote. And of course, like a true preacher of his day, the writer notes something from the Old Testament. That was the Bible of their time. And John the Baptist was a very successful preacher. The crowds were starting to come to where he was baptising at Jordan. And they were hearing his message. And they were responding to his message. And people were being baptised. And it seems maybe about some 
50 miles away from where John was baptising, in his home with his parents. There's always some conjecture as to whether he had any brothers and sisters at this time. Possibly, of course, he did, but whether they were Joseph's from a previous marriage or whatever. But Alan White seems to make the point that as he is at home with his parents, he leaves Mary and Joseph and responds to what he has heard. There's never enough information for us to understand precisely what was going through the mind of Jesus as he makes the decision now to leave home. There is no mention of any wife or children of his own. We only understand in essence that it is Jesus that is leaving home and he's leaving home alone. And as he ventures down that roadway from Nazareth down to reasonably close to Jerusalem, but in essence where uh, John was baptising was just on the northern shore or just inland from the northern shore of the Dead Sea. He's got plenty on his mind. We recall the incident where he was taken some almost 20 years earlier by his parents to the temple and he got caught up with the priests and various uh, religious know-it-alls of his day and he's talking backwards and forwards with them. He's asking them questions and of course the best way to have a debate is when you ask a question, somebody will turn around and instead of answering it, will ask you a question. So maybe this question and answer was going on for this 12-year-old. But as I say, some years later, he has now decided to leave home. He's walking through those dusty roads. And in my mind, he doesn't walk alone, though, as I've said, he probably has much on his mind. He was a very sociable character, so we're led to believe, was our friend Jesus. It's one reason why I can't wear his shoes. I'm not as sociable as he was. Sandals, I should have said. But he interacts with the various groups all of these people that he sees on the road have the same goal as he has, to go down and at least listen to this baptising person, John. And as Jesus interacts, he has one ear open to the prompting of the Spirit. He is essentially... On the one hand, walking with the crowds, but unlike most of those, he is also walking with the Spirit. And I think slowly but surely, built on what he had learnt in the temple those many years before, and building on what his mother essentially had taught him right through his life, built on what even in the small religious circles where he lived at Nazareth, things were starting to fall into place for Jesus, the son of Mary. Many commentators have picked up on the fact that Jesus is more often known as the son of Mary than as the son of Joseph. They seem to think that probably by the time that Jesus has left home, Joseph has already died. So we're certainly hoping that there are some brothers and sisters at home 
because I don't think Jesus would have found it easy to leave Mary alone. So he's walking. As I say, there's roughly about a distance of maybe 80 kilometres. So it's no short walk in the park. John, in his preaching, is telling his listeners that you may think I'm a bit of a spot-on person for preaching the gospel, but I tell you, there is one who is coming. You will have to listen to him because I am not worthy to loose the laces of his sandals. John, in his own way, as he knew, was preparing the way of the Lord. Jesus comes into the thronging crowd that is listening to John. He sees a large group of people. What his thoughts are, we don't know really, but I would conjecture that as he is firming up in his own mind what is going to happen to him, he realises that it is all bound up with these people that are thronging, <coughs> excuse me, that are thronging around John. So John has prepared the way. There comes a point of time within the next day or so of Jesus arising at the point where John was that John himself says, Behold the Lamb of God. And I think if Jesus had no a definite understanding of what was going to happen to him over the next however long it was going to take to happen in his life, he realised now that these people were going to be tied intimately into his understanding of God's call on his life. And as we read through the story of the life of Christ in his mission, he <coughs> demonstrates very early that he's aware that the end is an end of death. We can conjecture quite a bit. But as John was baptising Jesus, there was a bit of a controversy. It seems that uh, religious people like to have religious controversies. And uh, John, seeing Jesus, says, uh, just hold it there, brother. I am not the one to baptise you. You should baptise me. Jesus says, not so. I understand that what we are about to do, you baptising me, will fulfil all righteousness. And if you go back to those early verses of uh, Mark 1 and then broaden your study out to understand how the Old Testament taught of the coming ministry of the Christos. Jesus on that day was not necessarily known as Jesus Christ. Anybody in the crowd who knew him understood him probably as being the son of Joseph and Mary. But from this point of time onwards, things would change and they would change dramatically. Mark 1 verse 10, straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the, the heavens opened. 
we understand the he is not John the Baptist, but Jesus himself. And many commentators make the point that probably Jesus was the only one there. This is not gospel. Jesus was the only one there that saw the heavens being opened. But some have studied <coughs> the word of the heavens opened and they envisage a very dramatic incident where it seems that almost as if the heavens have been rent asunder. This is more than just a bolt of lightning, a thunderclap. The heavens were opened, rent open. And Jesus saw this. So he was looking up into the heavens and then he saw almost as a contrast to what was happening in the heavens, the, the, the very climactic rolling away of clouds and thunderclaps and all of this thing. Jesus sees the Spirit like a dove coming down, descending upon him. Now, not many of us have had the experience of a bird alighting on our shoulders. I think up in Queensland on our honeymoon, uh, Carol and I went to Carumban, I think it was, where there's a bird sanctuary and you have all these uh, lorikeets and parakeets and whatever other keets you can get and they flutter around and they land on your shoulder and sometimes they just dig their little claws in. Only time that's ever happened to me. But I don't envisage that that was quite like it was with Jesus. Like a dove. To me, this is a sense of the conviction is settling in the mind of Jesus. Now, I said earlier that as he walked from home to where John was, he was in company with the Holy Spirit. And that is probably why as this form, dove-like form was descending, he knew that that was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't descending on him much like the way an eagle or a raven would swoop down, catch you up and cart you away. No, this was much more subtle than that. And just as Jesus is getting to grips with all of the, what we would call the apocalyptic symbolism, this revelation that was going on, There came a voice from heaven. You are my beloved son. You are the one in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> John the writer would write a little later on. <coughs> talking about the love of God who gave his only begotten son. And we ought to acknowledge that there is in essence a difference between being the begotten son and being the beloved son. There was no other son in the family of God or anywhere indeed that came into existence the way that Jesus did. We can see in these few verses from Mark chapter 1, we can see the Trinity at work. 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there is a quite clear understanding in the mind of Jesus himself that this particular point in time, this is propitious, as we would say, it had destiny written all over it. This, no matter how it would work out, would mean a lot for many people. Indeed, even as we are here today, looking at this, reading about it, we know that at least as far as Mark the writer is concerned, what will happen in these few verses is probably more important than what happened that is recorded by Matthew and Luke in their early chapters and which we celebrate in the season that is upon us. If you were walking in Jesus' sandals at this point in time, what would you be thinking? Would it impact on you? I've mentioned that Jesus was probably uh, socialising a little bit. He saw the crowds there. He sensed what was about to happen. He knew it was important. It, he knew it was fate writing his future in large letters. We've mentioned the possibility that the Spirit was a walking companion with Christ. And we like to make the point that as we live our Christian lives, we should do so with the indwelling Spirit, which is the same way as saying, encourage the Spirit to walk with you. Take on board the responsibilities to do the works of God. So Jesus is poised. And verse 12 in and of itself is one verse that I've read many times. Wondered if I could ever read any adequate understanding of it. Verse 12 of Mark 1. Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Now we remember that John, as a baptising prophet, his headquarters, so to speak, was out in the wilderness. So obviously we're talking about the same wilderness where John was baptising as the wilderness where Jesus was driven, impelled, compelled, or oh, do we say forced by the Spirit? Jesus was as reliant on the Spirit's leading as we ought to be. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. John was pretty well looked after in the wilderness where he was at. They tell me he uh, survived on locusts and uh, in recent years there's been much ado about taking uh, locust type insects and uh, somehow uh, tizzying them up in some way to make them edible. I don't know whether I could take to that, but they tell me that uh, it would be an excellent source of protein. 
So maybe if my wife brings home a uh, locust sandwich, I might go and have a nibble on it. But I won't encourage her to do that. But it was part of John's diet. And there is, again, when you read commentaries, they, they don't like the word locust so much and they try to reinterpret it in some way. But the next thing that he, he uh, lived on was wild honey. Now, how does honey get to be wild? Well, naturally, you would think, oh, yes, well, he just was wandering around and he saw a honeycomb hanging from some branches and so on. But then when I tried to figure out the link between the wild beasts that Jesus was confronted with and the wild honey that John was confronted with, I thought, is there a difference in our understanding? If you were walking with Jesus down that dusty road and you saw John the Baptist over there doing his baptising and having a nibble here and there, you think, oh, I'll go over and join John for uh, afternoon tea. And then if in the same manner you saw Jesus out in the wilderness, no locusts, no honey, just wild beasts. You would probably be not quite so happy to go over and share an evening meal. There is this comparison and contrast between these two leading players in the early origins of the Christian movement. And the interesting thing about this is that all of a sudden there is injected into this scenario, for want of a better word, Satan. I may have mentioned before that Jesus, as he journeyed from home, was in the company of the Holy Spirit. It would seem... It would seem on the surface that once he is baptised and the Spirit is pushing him out, pushing him, it's the way to go, that's the way, no, don't go over there and have locusts and honey with John, that's the way to go. And Jesus knows what is coming. He knows what is about to happen. You can read the other couple of versions from uh, Matthew and Luke. On the one hand, you get the sense that Jesus is not tempted of Satan until the end of the 40 days. But also, you can look at it from the perspective, from the moment he is pushed out into the wilderness... The spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the adversary, the spirit of the one with whom he had battled in heaven with, was now his constant companion. We know the outcome. Uh, a little bit of a theological discussion went on, three questions asked, three questions answered. You can back it in that they weren't the only questions that were raised. But the breadth of those questions indicates to us the scope of Christ's ministry. His ministry would be based on the word of the Lord. Don't worry about turning stones into bread. Better still, turn it into uh, treated honey. It'll be sweeter. Don't worry about throwing yourself off the top of the temple, the edge of a cliff. There was more going on. And you've got to give Satan credit for some nous. He also understood what was going on. And 
it is noted that after those three temptations didn't achieve the desired result, that he went and left Jesus. And we like to think that he was thinking, yeah, okay, I'll have another go at him. This is not finished. I'll come back to this guy. I'll catch him out sooner or later. The thing that happens with Jesus is that like Daniel being confronted by a wild beast way back in the day, we can assume that those wild beasts in the wilderness probably impacted on Christ's physicality to no extent at all. But God is always equal to the task. A, a part of this experience that we often miss is that the angels ministered to him. Jesus has come out of the baptismal font, so to speak. He's been forced into a particular direction where he knows the adversary is waiting for him. And he goes forward. For 40 days, he's probably wrestling within his human self as to what all of this is about. And then if we think, well, why would the Spirit have to impel him to go? Surely Jesus realised what was coming. Possibly he did, possibly he did not. But put yourself in Jesus' sandals for a moment as he's looking out over that crowd. He would probably think, oh, I can have an excellent ministry amongst this group. I can play second fiddle to John the Baptist and I can help these people make up their minds to be baptised. We don't know precisely where Jesus was at. You can read a couple of chapters in the Desire of Ages and that will help flesh things out for you. But if you were in Jesus' shoes, how would that affect you? Have you ever stopped to think about it? There's a little um, quote that you can get in a little sort of uh, card form about uh, the uh, young person walking along the beachside and uh, he seems to be quite happy with the way things are going, talking to Jesus backwards and forwards and then suddenly he runs into a series of testing times in his life and he's very much aware that whoever it was that was walking with him didn't seem to be there helping him through this stage and so Jesus has to tell him well they were the times that I carried you and that's the promise that God gives to us that is the promise that is contained, understood, implied as strongly as it can be in the fact that the angels themselves ministered unto him. Now the problem is, we know that of all the angels that ever were, one third of them were down there uh, hanging about with Satan and uh, these angels of verse 13 aren't described as lost angels or saved angels or whatever. So we assume that these angels were the angels from heaven. But I wonder in their coming down from heaven under the express direction of the God of heaven, whether they also had to fight their way through to where Christ was at? Did they overcome what Satan had probably been trying to set up? We would believe so. But all of that aside, and we know that that conflict, while that lasted for 40 days in the wilderness, 
we know essentially every day after that, Jesus was tempted of Satan. And we are assured by Paul the Apostle that Jesus never sinned. He was not forgotten of Satan. He, Satan levied his temptations consistently against him. But as it was in the wilderness, so it was throughout all of his ministry. Jesus never succumbed to the wiles of the desert devil. And so, in closing, now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel. And one of the things that we learn from our reflection on Mark chapter 1 is that all that was happening was part of the gospel message. The victory of Jesus in this is, in essence, a or the gospel message. But it impacted on Jesus in such a way that he said, the time is fulfilled. And everybody starts running back to the book of Daniel, etc., etc. But I think in some ways what Jesus is saying, at this point, Satan has had his best shot at me and has come off the worse for wear. We could even say, as far as Jesus was concerned, he could look the adversary in the eye and said, your time is up, brother. But I think there is an even more important lesson, or two more important lessons in closing. Jesus says, finally, believe the gospel. Believe that my father, your father, wants you to be his beloved children. And that what you will see in the unfolding two or three years of Christ's ministry is the outworking of the gospel. Good news. But the point that I want to close on, really and truly, is the very simple statement, the kingdom of God is at hand. Do you believe that the kingdom of God is in this church at this time with each and every one of us. God bless you. I hope that you do realise that that is so. Thank you. Let us pray. At this time, Lord, we humbly beseech thee. During the past couple of hours, in Sabbath school and at church. We have listened to the gospel. Over the past quarter we've learnt that it is very easy under the pressure of a leader preaching to us, outlining God's will for us, to be able to say, Oh yes, Lord, I raise my hand, Lord. Bless me, Lord. And then yet, sometime later, somebody comes along and says, Why have you forgotten? We are here today Because you have called us through your spirit to come and worship together. Just as in those days when Jesus left home and came to be with John in Jordan. So we are called essentially moment by moment 
day by day, to be in a situation where the Holy Spirit is our travelling companion. We talk about praying without ceasing and there are other aspects. Rejoicing forevermore. This is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is our attitude through life. To pray, to rejoice, but then to witness to others. To help them come to know the victory that is available over all of the sins that do so easily beset us. Grant us this benediction, Lord, the outpouring of your spirit as we go our several ways for Christ's sake. Amen.